What's up, my friend? Welcome back to the Finding Direction podcast. First and foremost, I hope you are having an unbelievable day. I hope you are taking the fresh air into your lungs. I hope you are enjoying the sun if it's sunny where you're at. If it's not, that you're enjoying the clouds and ultimately that you're walking through your day with a little bit of gratitude for having another day on this earth and also for having some ears to listen to this podcast right now as you and I hang out with a friend of mine, Mr. Daniel Gomez. Now, a little bit about Daniel. He is a keynote speaker. He is an executive coach. And today, some of the things we start to talk about is how you can start to identify if you're undervaluing yourself and how you can start stopping it. We also talk about the impact that it has on every aspect of your life if you undervalue yourself. We will give you a daily practice to start increasing the value you have in yourself, and we dive into many, many more things on this episode. Uh, We're not going to waste any more time here. We're going to dive right into this conversation, and I know you are going to enjoy it. So here we go. Daniel Gomez, welcome to the show, my brother. Man, I'll tell you what, Steve, I'm honored. I'm, it's, I've been pumped up all week, five o'clock here in San Antonio. I save my energy for you. I'll tell you what, I'm ready. I'm focused and we're going to add some value. We're going to help people finding their direction in life, man. Let's go, man. I love it. So as we kick this off, can you give our listeners a little bit of an inside look as far as just like, who is Daniel Gomez? What do you do? And kind of what was the journey like to get there? Man, Daniel Gomez has always been the same, right? I think so many times in life, there's crap that's put on top of us, right? You got all this crap and you just got to take the crap off. But I think underneath all that crap, I've always laughed. I've always been the life of the party. (laughs) That's just my personality. (laughs) I I like to have fun. And he just, it's just about living life. And I think now that I'm a speaker and a coach and we have a very successful business now, it's really helping people find that value within themselves. And that's who I am. Mm. I just care and love about people. Sometimes my fault is this. I'll be honest, right? Sometimes you can care too much. (laughs) And people yeah. will drag you along the way, but I've learned to, you can't allow that to happen because people will take advantage of you. But for the most part, there's genuine people out there that need us and yeah. need Daniel Gomez. And I'm just the guy to want to pour value and show them that they do have value. Because one thing I've learned, Stu, is not over 90% of people undervalue who they are, man. And mm. they need to find out, hey, you know what? Open your eyes. You do have value. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I do. I just, But I do it in a fun way, right? We, of course, yeah. we got to be serious and hold them accountable. But I think so many times what I've seen in my business coaching is people are just too serious. And when you're serious, you get tense. Think of a golfer, right? If he's too serious, he gets tense. You're going to shank your ball. Not a good round. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Someone once told me, and I think you'd probably be a a believer in this philosophy. It's that if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Yeah. And I mean, you got, you got one time at this thing called life, one shot at it. It's like, you got to, you got to enjoy, you got to live, you got to laugh. And uh, even from, you know, chatting for a few minutes, I can see that you definitely enjoy life. Well, yeah, so- the, I love what you said, right? Because this is a, this is the thing we can go even deeper once we get the show rolling is this isn't a practice life. People think that we have a people think we're practicing. And ladies and gentlemen, when we're gone, I mean, whether whatever you believe in afterwards in the afterlife, but here on Earth, yeah, we only get one shot. And what are you going to do with it? True that. True that. So one thing that's interesting that you said that I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more from you is you said you help people find the value in them. And I'm curious if you could expand upon what you mean for that, right? Because, it, and it's interesting, you said 90% of people undervalue themselves, which is also really interesting. But how do you go about helping someone find the value that they do have? Because I'm sure there's some people listening to this that are going, you know, I'm trying to figure out my life, but it's like, well, what do I have to offer? You know what I mean? And and so how do you help people find the value in them? I love how you, how you said well, that. And how you in our that. book, right? We have our new book that came out, The Makings of a Millionaire Mind.com. And in our book, The Makings of a Millionaire Mind, The Makings of, Makings of a Millionaire Mind, there's a chapter called The Value System. And I wrote that because on a scale of one to 10 is kind of what I use just as a point of reference, right? Yeah. So just imagine everybody knows who Superman is, right? So you have a big S on your chest because you're Superman. He knows who he is. Well, as people, we have a big VS. It's our value system. And based on this value system is is how we make our decisions in life. The thing is this, most of us make poor decisions or we're scared to make that next level decision because we undervalue our confidence. We undervalue our abilities. We undervalue ourselves. And the thing is our self-image is of undervalue. So guess what? Our whole life is going to be undervalued and you never really 
capture that dream, capture that vision of what's inside of you dying to come out. And it's like a glass of milk, right? Think about it. Just, shake, <laughs> just, just imagine me and you are sharing cookies. We're having a glass yeah. of milk and Stu says, come on, let's go get some golf balls. Like, let's go. And we're out there for two hours. Like, oh crap, we forgot the milk. Well, what happens to that milk when we come back? It's spoiled, right? Yeah. We wouldn't dip our cookie in there because if we, if we dip our cookies in there, we're going to get sick. It's going to poison us. Well, that's the same way that untapped potential in our deep reservoirs, it goes, it gets spoiled and it rots us from the inside out. And that's where that sense of unfulfillment, we get bummed out and we just, right. We just, no matter what we do, we're not happy because we're not tapping into that potential that we all have. And the main reason is because of that value system, we undervalue ourselves. Hmm. And that's where the main problem is. Right. And the thing is, this is that when you realize that you bring more value to the marketplace, when you, when you bring more value to other people, you're like, you never saw it, right? Because I think you and me will agree that most people undervalue right, themselves. How do we know that? Because no one charges what they should charge. Everybody's scared uh, to raise their prices. Yeah. I'm like, no, raise your price. Because yeah, think about yeah. this. Just to say, hey, Stu, we're going to go to Miami, bro. I got us a great deal. We're going to be out there, Miami Beach. Everybody's going to be out there. I got us a great hotel. It's only $39 a night. $39 a night on the beach. What are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> it's a shack. Yeah. We, you got us a cardboard box. It's a perceived perception, right? Yeah. So if we price ourselves too low, then people don't see the value in it. Yeah. So, so let's say that I'm a client and I come to you and I'm like, you know, Daniel, I'm ready to step up. I'm ready to get to my next level. We start working together and you go, okay, he clearly undervalues himself. What's the process that you walk me through to, I guess, getting me to see my value more or to uh, like to raise that value? How, like, what would the steps be that you would take me through if I was a client that came to you and you're like, okay, clearly he's undervaluing himself. How do I, how do I get back to value? Well, the myself? thing is, this is that most people don't see their, the picture of themselves. We never take time. I think when, like for me, almost five years ago when my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, Right, right. I mean, we have the job title, so we think we're entitlement and right. It's a shadow, shadow level of success. We got the Rolex, we got all this stuff. But when I resigned to take care of my wife, I looked in the mirror and I didn't like who I was, to be honest with you, Stu. Right. I didn't like Daniel Gomez. Right. The busyness of 100 employees, the busyness of used cars, new cars, the busyness of going out because we weren't going out anymore because my wife had a double mastectomy. Right. There was no. So you talk about isolation. Yeah for maybe three months straight. And you like, right. You look in the mirror and you're like, man, I didn't think I was such an asshole sometimes. Right. But you see that because you right, life slows down, you start to reflect and you're like, there's some things I need to change. So for me, it was really undervaluing the fact that I didn't realize I had so much pain inside of me. Right. I didn't realize I had so much pain. So when you undervalue yourself because you don't deal with the issues that are deep, Instead of celebrating Stu, I'm like, ah, oh, he just thinks he's all big shit, right? You're jealous. You're envious. And I talk about that in the book. So when people come to me, the, one of the first things I say is, what's the picture of you? Well, what do you mean? Yeah. Inside yeah. of us, right? Inside of us, we all have a picture of how we see ourselves. Yeah. And most people never ask themselves that question, right? The quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask yourself. Amen. So that's a question that I ask them. What's the picture you have of yourself? Yeah. Most of them say, well, what do you mean? It's not yeah. a difficult question. The picture of you inside. Yeah. What's that picture you hold of yourself? How do you see yourself? Mm. And most people, they don't have an answer right away. So we go deep in that. And the truth is when we go deep, right? Whether you're male or female guys, right? At some point, that handsome buff guy at the gym he got dumped sometime, right? That's why he's a butthead because he's hurt. He got hurt by some girl. <laughs> Same thing by that yeah. girl, that hot, that hot babe girl at the gym. Somebody yeah. got tired of her at some point. So she has that pain. So it doesn't matter how beautiful you are on the outside or how handsome you're on the outside. It doesn't matter how average you are on your looks. We've all been hurt at some, to some capacity and we never deal with those things. So in return, we put up this shield of, right? Our heart gets cold. Yeah. Oh, and we get and we get a cold heart. I had a cold heart. I didn't realize that, right? Yeah. My my cold heart came from pouring into employees that like, man, look, I hope this girl, I hope this guy. Like these people don't appreciate anything. But mm -hmm. you don't see it because it's a process of right, three years, five years. I was in the automotive industry 20 years. 
Yeah. And it just builds up. And the next thing you know, it's like gaining weight, right? You don't want to, nobody wants to gain weight. You wake up one day like, how did my jeans not fit me anymore? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting too. I think, you know, part of the perception we have about who we are and how we value ourselves is the stories we tell ourselves on a continuous basis. And I think one thing that's really interesting is we look at this, you know, piece of like, are you valuing, valuing yourself and how can you value yourself more is oftentimes our brain clings on to negative things more than positive. And the reason is because it's a survival instinct, right? Back when we were cavemen, cave women, if something said, someone said something bad about you, like you had to pay attention because if you didn't and something led to that, like you could die or get, you know, pushed out from the pack. And I think one thing that's interesting that I've noticed when it comes to this, you know, like how much are you valuing yourself is asking yourself, well, when you were young, maybe did you have someone that said something to you that, put you down, right? Or did you have a teacher that said, oh, you're, you're talking too much or a teacher that said, you're not smart. And what's really interesting is I think sometimes we can go through life and let's say you had three times someone said something that put you down as a young kid. You'll cling on to that when in regards, if you change your perception, there's probably three, maybe more than that, positive things people said about you. And if you can cling on to the time where um, a teacher, a relative, a, a parent, someone said, oh my God, you're so smart or, or you're so creative or you're so um, just, you know, you got so much drive. Like if you can grab those positive ones and let those stories drive your perception and your value, you're going to show up in such a different light than letting those old ones navigate you. But I think like you said, it, it really does go back to doing that deep work of like, okay, what are the things going on inside of my head that's ultimately driving my actions? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give your listeners a hack, right? Let's do this exercise I do with my clients. Love it. Oh, so, so it's, it's to go deeper. It's, we do this, right? So just role play with myself. Okay, Steve. So cool. Stu, repeat, re repeat after me, Stu, right? Stu is valuable. Stu is valuable. Stu is loved. Stu is loved. Stu is worthy. Stu is worthy. Stu is enough. Stu is enough. Stu is deserving. Stu is deserving. Stu is amazing. Stu is amazing. Stu is forgiven. Stu is forgiven. Right? So I have my clients do this exercise. Of course, I put music in the background. It's a slower pace. We go yeah. deep. And you'd be surprised that the block comes because they can't say that. Hmm. Or if they say it and we go through the exercise, and it usually takes, right? I usually, it's, it's usually about a 20-minute exercise. Because we, 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 we kind of do some more deeper dive into the affirmation. Yeah. I say, Stu, out of all those affirmations, which one was the hardest? Hmm. And many say valuable, right? Because I'll make them say Stu is valuable, then I'll make them say I am valuable. And they try, some even cry. They, I mean, they just break down. Yeah. For, for women, I'll throw in the beauty, right? I'll say Heather is beautiful. And you'd be surprised how many women can't say, like, when they get to yeah. that, they, they say yeah. it, but they choke up. And, you, you, you know, as, as, as a coach, you tune into that. And then, okay, so we go, so it makes you think you're not beautiful. So we just yeah. take a deeper dive. But most people don't realize it until we get there. And they'll be like, I never knew that about myself. Yeah. No, that's, that's powerful. Even as I was saying it, I was like, I'm, a, I'm getting, like, chills over here saying these things because yeah. it – it is interesting when you say that and you put your name in it. And I would encourage for anyone that's listening to this now, go rewind 30 seconds and say it as I was saying it, do it with your own name, because I think it really is. That's a beautiful thing. And then digging into if it's hard to say, why was it hard to say? And that's going to help you kind of dig to the core. And then once you realize what the core is, then you, you get to, you get to make a decision, right? Am I going to let this continue to control me or do I want to pick something else that's going to allow to guide me? Yeah. And, and actually in the book, Beautiful. I walk into the exercise. I, I do that same exercise in my book, the makings of a millionaire mind. Cause see, nobody wants to write a book about money because everybody can't talk about money and they think you're just this really <laughs> egotistic yeah. guy, but really yeah. becoming a millionaire, the having the makings of a millionaire mind is a journey that we, it's journey of who you're becoming. It's really the journey of the person you become. And for me, it was dealing with all these issues of, of who is Daniel Gomez, right? Who am I, what am I not dealing with in my life? And a lot yeah. of it, right, is, is what I talk about is, think. You, I mean, you're very successful. You know a lot of successful people. How many stories have we heard, Stu, that, man, 
so and so made a million dollars and then oh crap they're broke two years later or man so and so made it big a coach yeah. made it like look at how many coaches left us in 2020 why because a they didn't have the foundation the proper foundation and b many of the, many of successful people doesn't matter where you are doesn't have to be coaching whether you're a singer or american idol right they they yeah. a lot of people like they self implode yeah they self destruct they blow up in the inside and that's what happened. So the whole purpose of the book was, I'm going to give you the right approach, the right attitude, and the right heart, and becoming a millionaire God's way, so you so you don't self destruct, so you don't self implode. That's the reason I wrote the book because anybody can be successful overnight. But not yeah. that I've been a big success my whole life. I say I have right in my own eyes, yeah. because you know by God's grace, we've we've I've done well. I've been good with money, and but it's really more than the money. It's really like hey, yes, we paid off our last house. Yes. We have money in the bank. Yes, we've had all these toys, but it's really the people that we get to help the homeless, the needy, the mm. orphanages in, 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 in Africa. Yeah. And people don't see that. But the thing is that regardless of what Daniel Gomez inspires touches, it's successful. Why? Because I'm success. And when you realize that you're success, the biggest lie that we've been told as entrepreneurs is, right? Hustle and grind, hustle and grind, hustle and grind. Who, who wants to do that? I don't. Yeah. But when your vibration gets so high, when your value system gets so high, you attract the opportunities. Yeah. People come chasing you, looking for you. And I can yeah. tell you, like, I was in Hawaii last week for, uh, I spoke over there at a conference. I was there eight days. I took my wife with me. And I was like, man, hon, I, I blocked out my whole schedule. They didn't even know, like, right, what to expect. I'd never done yeah. that. And, and I was like, I said, you know what? Screw it. We're going to have fun. Well, I spoke. And next thing you know, it's like our vendors table was busy the whole week. We made over, I mean, we made thousands and thousands of dollars. And yeah. I, I don't say that because to brag, but just to prove the point that when you deliver value to the marketplace, the marketplace is going to chase you down and pay you what you're worth. And yeah. man, it was, <laughs> I had a better week in Hawaii than I think I would have had here. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool, man. And, and what a way to, you know, have fun doing it again. Like we were talking about earlier, going to Hawaii doing what you love, adding that value. And, and I'm curious if we dive into the value and then I kind of want to go backwards in your story. We're going to do it a little different today. But do you feel like there was a moment in your life when you had that sort of deep internal introspective moment of going, damn, like I don't value myself. Like, do you remember what, if you had that moment and if you did what it was and if you'd be open to sharing it? I think it was, for me, it wasn't me. I don't mean that like for me, it was my son, Julian. He's my life. Hmm. I love him. Yeah. He's 22 years old now. And I didn't realize how hard I was on him, how much of a butthead I was. Hmm. On. And when my wife got diagnosed with cancer, like, right. I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It's, it's not going to save you. <laughs> you learn that pretty quick. So I said, Hey son, uh, you want to go with me to a men's group? He goes, well, what is that, dad? I said, it's at the church. He goes, I think I told him, I think it'd be a good idea if we go. Yeah. And he went, right? Cause he's, I mean, even though he, he was mad at me and he hated me, he still loved me cause I'm his dad. Mm -hmm. So we went, they asked a question and the question that they asked, I was very surprised by his answer. And the question was, is if this was God, how close are you to God? How lukewarm are you or how cold are you to God? that you don't even believe in him. And he goes, they asked him, right? Cause he was at the men's group. He was at the yeah. table. It was about probably like 70 men there. And he just, they happened to call on him and he goes, well, I don't know if there's a God. And I wanted to cry because I'm like, this, like, cause we would go to church. Yeah. It's not like he was a stranger to yeah. God's word or the environment. And I, I realized that, man, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. And I think it really hurt me when he said that I want the, the, the old Daniel wanted to like say, what the hell do you mean? Right? Like, but yeah. I really, that made me look inside myself. Like I've never looked inside myself before. Yeah. And I realized now looking back, I was like, how can he believe in a God or believe in a higher power? If he can't see, say God's love within his own old man here no. on earth. Right. Yeah. So it really made me like, I've cried, man. I, I think as, a, as an adult, I'm 48 years old. 
48 years young, let me say. And, and yeah, there you these, go. Past, these past four and a half years, I've never cried so much. Like in these past four and a half years, I cried more than the last 44. Mm. But it sounds like beautiful tears, growth yeah. tears. Right? Growth and hurt, right? Healing, forgiving yeah. yourself. Yeah. But the mistake that we make as men and women is that we, we think we forgive somebody once and we're done, or we forgive ourselves once and we're done. But it's the farthest from the truth because just imagine the foundation on a skyscraper that's 100 stories. I, just, I was just in New York City. We had a mastermind over there here a couple of weeks ago, and you're at the Empire State Building, which is hundreds of stories, right? A lot, 80 something. I don't know how many stories, yeah. but it's high. high. And then you got these other 10 story apartments or buildings. Well, the foundation on the Empire State Building is so much deeper and stronger. Yeah. It has to go into the earth. Why? Because if not, it's, it's not, it, won't, it won't hold. Well, yeah. we try to build the Empire State Building on a smaller foundation, and it doesn't work that way. And that's why we self-sabotage ourselves, because you don't go deeper to give deeper forgiveness. You don't, give a, you don't, you don't release that deeper resentment. Yeah. And that resentment turns into envy and jealousy, and then you self-sabotage yourself. You're so jealous and envious of everybody else because you haven't dealt with your own issues that you can't celebrate them. So guess what? <laughs> What you complain about and you're envious about, you're going to stay stuck in business no matter how hard you try because you're putting out that negative vibration that's a, yeah. right? it's, it's a, it's a wider bandwidth and it's, it's going to override what you're trying to do. Yeah, powerful. It, it is true. You got you to gotta go deep. You got to build a foundation. And when you do that, everything's easier to just continue to stack success on. And so let's say we jump I'm back into your life for a second. Like We'll go way back. And I'm curious to hear and dig a little bit more into the journey um, for you, you said you were in the automotive industry for 20 years. I'm curious, kind of how did that first come about? Like, did you grow up and you said, you know, I always want to be in the automotive industry or kind of how'd you get there? Man, the, what, the truth is that my dad got sick on me and my job that I had, I was actually, I got my degree, my associates in horticulture. And I thought I was going to be a, like that, that plan behind you is called a, the, the Dracina Massigiana, right? It's either a Janet Kane or a corn plant. <laughs> Let's go. And that's what I went to school for. So I was, I would work my way up. Then my dad got sick on me and uh, he ended up getting st stuck with cancer. And next thing you know, it's like, I resigned to take care of my dad. So I ended up, he ended up passing away, but that was my first entrepreneur journey. We, we had a piñata store. And nice. I said, if we can sell piñatas, right? Cause I was selling them. I was knocking on doors and we, were, we got in with some big grocery store chains, HEB here in San yeah. Antonio. We got into a couple of HEBs, some, La Fiestas. And I mean, we we're doing good. And when he passed away, I just lost the drive. Yeah. I ended up taking a job at Clark American checks and I was there for a short stint. That's when my faith really started to build up. And, um, I saw, I said, I, I hated it. I hated it. Cause it was a cubicle. I'm not, I'm not meant to be in an <laughs> office all day. Yeah. Me neither. Can't do it. And then my mentor finally said, you know what? God says, go find a job. And I just started looking for a job. And, and when I saw this ad in the car, it was in, this was, I'm giving my age away now. It was a newspaper <laughs> ad. And this guy had a big old smile. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I told my wife, what do you think about car sales? She goes, I don't know. But yeah. I said, well, in my mind, right? Hell, I can sell piñatas. I can sell anything. That was what I was thinking. Because totally. right? yeah. if you don't know what a piñata is, it's like a, it's like a party thing that you beat up for a kid's party, right? It's a car, a punching bag. <laughs> put and, candy uh, in it. And, yeah. 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 Piñatas are great. So I just, I went and applied and um, went to this first one. My, my friend goes, well, just check out the atmosphere, right? See what the vibration is like. Not, he didn't say vibration. He goes, just see what the spirit's like. Right. See what the, the atmosphere is like. And went to this one dealership. It, it was like totally like, nah, you could just feel it was cold. Yeah. And I went to this other one and the guy goes, well, what? You're young, man. He goes, why do you want to sell cars? I was like, I believe I can sell cars, right? I was 26. And then, I, but on his, on his desk, he had a scripture of, uh, Right, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, and that was like a sign because that was one of the first scriptures I I learned when my dad was diagnosed with his liver cancer and colon cancer. Interesting. And I just worked my way up. I just went in yeah. there, and I had no idea what I was doing. And <laughs> yeah. the first the first year I hit salesman of the year, second year salesman of the year, and I just stayed selling for three and a half years and worked my way up to sales manager, and that's where I really learned sales. Right, I think a lot of yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs need to learn how to sell because. If it wasn't totally. for that, you, 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 I wouldn't have made it. And I think when I came out and all this happened with my wife, I mean, I didn't, I don't want to say I blew up overnight, but I think in my eyes, like 
I'm thinking everybody's doing it. I mean, people laughed at me, right? Because you're going to be a what? A motivational speaker? You know how many <laughs> Hispanic, Mexicans, motivational speakers there are? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, exactly. There's none. And there's a lot of motivational speakers. What do you think you're going to make it? But I just said, well, I don't know. But I under- I think I had the business mindset. Right. So when I started what I was doing, it's like it just, I just took over what I was doing, right? Like I was telling you the other day, right? In the automotive industry, you, you open the month, you close the month. You open the month, you close the month. So right. Tuesday night, what am I doing? I'm closing the month. Why? Because I don't want to carry anything because in the automotive industry, you're not allowed to carry deals over. You got to close all your business from the month before. Yeah. But those are those are those are habits and characteristics that I've carried. And next thing you know, I'm speaking on stage, and the United States Air Force found me on Google. Yeah. So I thought cool. it was a hoax. I was like, "What?" They're like, "Yeah, they're like Daniel Gomez." I'm like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Whatever." I'm like, "How did you find me?" They're like, "We googled leadership, and you came up." And then the guy goes, <laughs> "He said something," and I'm like, "What'd you say?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Security Hill." I know. I knew Security Hill from just before. Yeah. He goes, you know what, man, we, we just, we, we, we remodeled. I don't mean to be wasting your time. He goes, but we just remodeled our auditorium and we put like 300,000. If you want to come check it out before you speak and make a decision, I'd love to have you. I, I would invite you to lunch and come over here. And I was like, okay. At this time I was a nobody. Right. I mean, in the speaking yeah. world. So I walk in there and I'm like, like, so, I mean, inside I'm, I have all this saliva. I'm dripping like, yeah, yeah. you're like, what? Yeah. And I'm trying go. to play my poker card, right? Well, let me check our schedule. Let me see what's available <laughs> on that day. I get, I go yeah. outside. I'm like jumping up and down. Yeah. Right. I told my wife this day, you got to take off. You got to come record me. So the video to that, to this date, to that video, I have it on my website and it's Amazing. my wife videotaped it with an iPhone. And, <laughs> Let's go. And, and it's just, it's a bootleg video. But it's good quality, but not bootleg. But I mean, she did it with her iPhone. And it, <laughs> yeah, it's it. I, I leave, you know, I leave it there because I don't care who you are. Over 95 percent of the speakers in the world have never trained in the United States Air Force. And I got yes. to do that. God gave me yeah. that opportunity. So I Amazing. just leave it because nothing tops that. And that was my big break because I say, hey, Stu, if I can add value to the United States Air Force, what makes you think I can add value to For you? Sure. What can they say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing. So, so it's true then that if you can sell pinatas, you can sell just about anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it worked out. I'm, I'm curious. Then you know you're doing it for 20 years. You're successful in it. You're doing very well. Um, what was the major like needle on the haystack or needle on the camel's back that they say that made you go? this chapter's closed and I'm going to go be a speaker and I'm going to go do that because it sounds like you, you were doing well. Um, you know, was it something you always thought about and finally, you know, something know. happened and made you do it or walk us through that. I, I think, I, I think the, the decision my wife made was to have a double mastectomy when she had her breast cancer. And the thing is that like at first, right, my boss was cool. He would, they were, they, they were, they were, I would say on a scale of one to 10, they were probably like an eight supportive. But after my wife started healing physically, like the emotional yeah. trauma started coming in, right? It's just like a man losing his testicles. You know, when a woman <laughs> loses her breast, she loses her I, identity. I had, I had testicular cancer to bring this full circle. <laughs> yeah, my brother did so, too. So I, my, yeah. my brother went through this. And it just, um, it was just, it was hard for her in one day. Yeah. Like she never totally. wanted, like put it this way. She was changing her blouses like two or three times a day. And I like... I was like, what are you doing? She's like, well, nothing. It doesn't feel right. Well, when you go from a C cup to no cup and that's all the clothes you have, right? I mean, that, yes. that self-image starts to go down pretty quick. So one day, um, right, she, was, she, she wasn't too depressed, I don't think. I mean, I can't speak for her, but she was kind of going downhill. Uh, she was descending, right? And, and I just, one day I got home and she never got dressed really. And then she was like dressed. She goes, hey, let's go out to eat dinner. I was like, what? Like she caught me off guard because yeah. by this time it was just, there was no, it was, we were like in survival mode to say, because the thing is, I just wanted her to live to say, right? Yeah. She goes, Hey, let's go have dinner. I'm like, okay. So I got dressed and we go and she's laughing and we end up having a margarita, have a good time. And granted, right. This is after her double mastectomy. So we took a picture, put it on Facebook. And then the next day though, she was just crying. She was like, I'm not beautiful. You know, you're going to leave me like, right. Cause mm. when, if, if, yeah. for those that don't know out there, when you have a double mastectomy, it's not just the fact that you lose your breast. It's like you lose the foundation of your breast. So 
no matter what woman you are, your shape, your your chest caves in. It's like somebody hits you so hard that you have two big old like holes in your chest. So it's like it, it's it's indented. And um, so I just called my boss and said, you know, I'm not gonna make it in. My wife's not doing good emotionally. He goes, well, no, she, I thought she was better. I go, yeah, well, physically, but it turned into a big old argument. And I said, I'm not going to go in, man. So Monday morning came in. He goes, hey, where you at? I was like, I told you I'm not going to go in. Yeah. And I just, it just came full circle. And I said, I think this is where I resign. And my intentions were to go back, right? Because in the automotive, this was in November. So in the automotive industry, every January, they, you know, there's always opportunities because people get right. let go. New year and yeah. So my intentions were to go back. And just one day I was getting dressed for an interview just to go see what's going out there in December. And I found this old email because I would go with Chevrolet, right? I ran Chevrolet dealerships and um, we would give out these awards to the athletics department. And one day the principal said, Hey, you want to say some words, Daniel? I'm like, I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> and I sat down and I just felt like in my heart, God said, Hey, you just talked about attitude. Talk about attitude. Like 20 huh. minutes later, I said, Hey, you know, ma'am, I can, I think I can talk about attitude for 20 minutes. She goes, or 10 minutes. Go ahead. Next thing you know, 30 minutes later, I have 300 kids yelling and screaming. I'm a winner. I'm a champion. I love myself. And that so was really cool. the birth of who I, that I had that ability to do it because I had never really done it. And I just was crazy enough when God said, I, I want you to be a motivational speaker. I just yeah. said, okay. And my wife thought, my, my wife would tell me now she thought I lost it. She goes, we're going to be what? <laughs> right. Cause I left a quarter million dollar a year job. Yeah. She just thought I was like, <laughs> yeah. And it's beautiful when, you know, when you close a door, other doors open. Right. And it was like, I mean, straight up sign from God. It was like, all okay, right, you close this chapter. Like, here's this thing. And I'm sure, you know, once you had those 300 kids jumping up and down, you're like, this, this is my new high that I'm going for this rather than, you know, X amount of cars a month. And uh, obviously it's worked out extraordinarily well for you. So, yeah, it's been it's, it's been a great ride. I think just the fact of the fact that you can really change people's lives. Mm. I think there's nothing been, like it. No, I think in January, it never really hit me. Right. And, and, and you mentioned Tony Robbins, right. You, you do, you have, you do, you do work with Tony and, but what stuck out to me one day I was asleep and I woke up and I just heard this background of Eric Thomas <laughs> and Eric Love Thomas, you, he would talk about, Hey, I can go to, I can go to high schools and I can crush it. I can go to prisons and I can crush it but he never felt like he belonged in corporate and he was stuck mentally, right? His self-image. Yeah. Well then less, he reached out to Les Brown and Les Brown said, don't you ever, ever, ever say you don't belong anywhere. And, and Les Brown coached them and mentored them. Yeah. And this is what Les Brown took. And this is what I took for Daniel Gomez. He goes, you're going to reach people that Tony Robbins will never reach. You're going to reach people that I will never reach. The only reason you're not number one, E.T., is because you don't believe you're number one. And he said that changed his whole wow. paradigm. And I listened to him, right? Wow. And if you think, right? And I'm Daniel Gomez, right? A Hispanic name, Mexican-American. And it hit me, right? I was like, you know, there's people that E.T. will never reach that I can reach. Yeah. And when I went to, to speak at Create in, in January of this year, Right. It was it, bat, the, bat, right. Usually when I'm a keynote speaker, I'm OK with it because it's just me. I'm OK. Right. I mean, I'm, they pay me my 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 honorarium and it's just yeah. me, maybe an opening speaker. But usually it's just me. So I'm like, hey, the spotlight's on Daniel. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's it's like you get used yeah. to that. Well, you go to this create day one. I open up with day one. So, right. John Max was our keynote speaker. Batter up. Jetsy Eitzler, number two. Right. Yeah. Batter up. Dave Meltzer, number three. And then I'm like, then Anthony, I didn't know who Anthony Trucks was at the time. Now I know who yeah, he is. Yeah. He came up next. And then I'm like, then Daniel Gomez. So like, I have all the heavy hitters before me and then me. Yeah. So I'm a little nervous, right? I'm like, man, like God says, just shut up and I'm going to speak to you. Just get on stage. I'm going to speak through you. Wow. I got up there and boom, right? Whoever didn't know who I was, before they knew me afterwards. And yeah. I say that in humility because right. I held, I held my own by God's grace. Right. We sold out of books. My assistant at the time, Maria, she's like, what are we going to do? I was like, I don't know. She goes, you know what? 
I hadn't finished my book yet. She goes, we're going to pre-sell the makings of a millionaire mind. But people came up. The reason I say that is because people came up and bought our books or crying like the message hit home. Yeah. And you never know how powerful your story is. You never know how powerful what you can share with somebody. And a lot of the people that came up to us that day were Hispanic, Latinos, yeah. Mexican, Americans. And they're like, man, I've never seen a Mexican out here speaking. You did great. And it just, I realized barely in January that I'm going to reach people that yeah. many other speakers will never reach. And I share that with you because look, I had this poster made after that. I'm going to be the number. My goal is to be the number one motivational speaker in the world. I Let's believe go. it. I believe it because I'm going to reach people that Tony Robbins will never reach. I'm going to reach right. people that Eric Thomas will never reach. I'm going to reach people that Les Brown will never reach because they need hope, right? Everybody needs hope, but it's just, it gave me a different perspective that people need to hear what Daniel Gomez has to say. Yeah. And, and it sounds like, you know, nowadays, obviously you're speaking all over literally the world. Um, I'm curious because I know you speak on a, you know, many different things. I'm curious if let's say someone came to you and they go, you know, Daniel, there's only one message you'll be able to share on stage for the rest of your life. What would that one message be that you would say if people only, and they could never hear from you again, they only saw you on stage that one time and, and some, they couldn't get books. They couldn't learn. Like what's the one message you would leave your drop of Daniel Gomez onto them? What, what would that one message be? Well, it would be tied into the value system, right? Because out of the value system, right? When you have out of the value system, that's where the commitment comes in. If you have lack of commitment is because you undervalue yourself, mm. letting people know they matter. Right. So within that one message of the, that, right. Of, of the value system and really yeah. let them know that, Hey, you matter more than you realize. Like I talk about commitment. I talk about value system. I talk about, right. That, that there is a difference inside of you that needs to come out. And I just tie all that on together. So I guess well, if I had a, that, that would be this, right. So the title of that would be my other book. You were born a fly. And you were born a fly. Why? Because you matter. You have more value than you realize. And the moment you stop being interested and you're committed to it, that's when the results are going to show up because everybody does what's right. When you're interested, you do what's easy. When you're committed, right. you do the crap that's hard. Yeah. You make it happen. Yeah. Love so it. it would be, you were born a fly, man. It would be that that's, Let and it goes go. back to your value system because it's unfortunately most people undervalue themselves. And I said that at the beginning, but it just, if it, it just resonates, it just, it doesn't matter. I've seen VPs of businesses, executives that I, yeah. it's just, right. Those are the people that are micromanagers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the good thing. And, and I love that one message you share with people. The good part is obviously you being on the podcast today, anybody that's listening to us can get loads more of you. So um, <laughs> as we start to wrap up for today, I'd be curious, you know, if people are going, man, I need, I need more of Daniel Gomez in my life. I need more of what you're sharing and everything you're up to. Where's the best place people can find you, follow you, um, just, you know, continue to be around you more. Yeah. Well, I'll tell, I would say this. I would go to our, go to our new website. We have our new website, the makings of a millionaire mind.com, the makings of a millionaire mind.com. You can send us a message through there. You can get our new book and really on, um, my big handle is Instagram. I mean, not Instagram, LinkedIn. I have over Perfect. close to 15,000 followers or Daniel Gomez. Our brand is Daniel Gomez inspires and that's on social media, but really I would just go to the makings of a millionaire mind.com and you can connect with me there. And my email is awesome. Daniel at Daniel Gomez speaker.com. That's Daniel at Daniel Gomez speaker.com. Send me an email. And I, I, I don't believe I have, we, we do, I have like two of those info ad, but I don't like those, right. I personally don't like info ad, but just send it to me directly. Me, me or my assistant will go through our emails and she does that for me. So it's one Love of the that. best things I ever did is have my assistant take over my emails. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. And, and to clarify the making of a millionaire mind.com, is it making with a G or with an S like the makings, makings. like makings, M A K I N G S the makings. Perfect. Okay, the cool. makings just, of a millionaire mind.com. Just wanted to make sure we got that right. So um, last question I have for you. This is something we ask for all of our guests because we really believe in helping people find direction, but we believe massively in doing it through action, right? You're not just going to sit on your couch and life comes together. You got to take some action. And so I would be curious from you, what would you say is one thing someone listening to this can do 
in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life. So I would say this, find five or 10 affirmations that speak to you that, that maybe you need confidence, right? So you would say, I am confidence. Maybe you need to value yourself, right? More say I am valuable hmm. and whatever comes to your heart, jot it down on a piece of paper. But this is what's huge for me. Write it on your God darn bathroom mirror. Because the first 20 minutes that you wake up, you're still in that theta stage. You're still in that dream state. Why is that important? Because once you become 26 years old, your mind is full grown, right? Your brain is your brain. Your thoughts are your thoughts. The only way you're going to change that is through repetition. And the best way to reprogram your mindset is the first 20 minutes of every morning because you're, th- you're still in that dream state. If you look at my bathroom mirror, my wife got mad at me. We just bought our, our dream house two years ago. Yeah. And uh, I have like 40 affirmations on my bathroom mirror because it oh, works. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, I got my boat today, right? My boat's on my affirmation. Yeah. And and, and I would have never thought I would have bought a, a boat that costs over 100,000. Right. And I don't say that impressively, but just to show that when you dream big enough. Five years ago, three years ago, but that's how intentional I am about putting these affirmations on my bathroom mirror. Yes. My bathroom mirror. And it makes a huge difference too. Love it. Love it, man. Well, everybody can definitely do that. I would say in the next 24 to 48 hours, um, Daniel, one more time, my man, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for adding so much value. And I know everybody's going to get so many nuggets from this and, uh, yeah, I'm going to be listening to it myself again, a few more times. So thank you so much for being here and we appreciate you uh, a ton, Daniel. Thanks so much. No, man. Well, thank you for having me. You're a great host and you made it fun. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, everybody. God bless y'all.